Welcome to NCCP, a United Methodist community featuring locations at Grace, Greenmount, and St. John's in Hampstead and Upper Cove, Maryland. You can also find us online at nccpumc.com and on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So we're going to do some friendship discussion over the next three years. Or three years. That'd be a long, that's a long sermon. We all know Donna needs friends, and so we're really going to try to help her for three years. Can you imagine doing something for three years like that? Having that picture up there for 150 whatever weeks, 56 weeks. That would get kind of old, wouldn't it? But anyway, three weeks. Three weeks. So it's a mini-series. What are those folks doing in the picture? Selfie. Selfie, all right. They tend to be of retirement age. Right, Bob? All right. Not saying you're of retirement age. I'm just saying. There's a hashtag, said no friend ever. So that's just our attempt to be clever to name the series, said no friend ever. But if you are on social media of any sort, um, you'll see that tag, that hashtag every once in a while in some variation said no one ever is actually where it started and then you can fill in the blank said no teacher ever, said no farmer ever, whatever. Said no husband ever, I'm right, you're wrong, whatever, you know. Anyway, but the point is, the real point is that we want to look at what makes a good friend. What makes us a quality friend. Um, and in fact, what is really important for us is that we have quality friends and that we are a quality friend to someone else or to other folks. Not the quantity of friends that we have. So it's not important the quantity. It's the important thing is the quality. And so we're going to look at that. One of the ways um, folks say that you can tell if you have a quality friend or, or who your quality friend, who are your real friends in life are the ones, if you think about it, who can you call or text at two in the morning now that you're an adult, if you are an adult. Now Luke can text anybody he wants at two in the morning, <laughs> all right? So, uh, but as you get older, and your friends tend to be in bed, who can you text or call um, at 2 in the morning? My mom texts Annika at 2 in the morning, even on school nights. She'll text her, like Annika will say, call, text her nanny like at 7.30 at night, and she'll get a reply at 1.30 or 2 in the morning. And you're like, Mom, you can't text Annika on a school night at 2 in the morning. And, uh, I guess the real thing is Annika turn your phone off at 2 in the morning. So who can you call on at 2 in the morning? That's a, that's a good measure. There's other measures, but that's a good measure. And so if you're just thinking this morning, like who, who are those people in your life? And who can call you? And you know, at any time, the point is, who, who can you count on and, and who can count on you? So just briefly, Job uh, here is going to help us look at some qualities and look at some characteristics of, of this job of being a friend. Again, Job's a righteous man. He's put to this test. We don't really know exactly why he's put to a test, uh, but it's a great book to read. Um, and we know you don't even have to be, a, you, we, you and I don't have to be biblical scholars to to know that Job is a book about testing and how we handle it. And so that's familiar to us. But it's always good, even if you've read it before, to, to reread it and, and to wrestle with it um, as you go forward. Um, he feared God, the scripture tells us over and over again, and he avoided all things evil, the scripture tells us. Again, seven sons, seven, th um, three daughters. They were very close. They feasted regularly. They did all the things they were supposed to do. They were good to their neighbors. Uh, they were just good people um, in, the, in the scripture sense here. 
Um, and then this is also the book where we get the first time that, that Satan or the accuser is actually named or, or mentioned in that way. Of course, in Genesis, we get, you know, the serpent and we get references to the, this, this sense of evil. But this book is the first time we really have a name to the face. And so that's an interesting part of the book as well. And then we have, um, you know, even in secular society, you know, people that don't read the Bible much or pay attention to Job, um, even um, on a cursory note, just in casual conversation, a lot of people, not all of course, but a lot of people uh, will know there's something in here about friends of Job and how they didn't handle it quite right. Um, and so, again, even if it's been a long time since you've read this, you know there's something in here about two or three friends um, that, that don't say the right thing. Um, and so that might be familiar to us as well. And we're going to get to that. But today, we're going to look at the friends in a different light, in a positive light. And so the scripture that we just had read to us um, goes again like this. And I'll, and I'll read, just I'll paraphrase a little bit. When Job's three friends heard about all this disaster that happened to him, they came. They showed up. When his three friends that were very hard on, and we will be hard on them next week, we'll be hard on them for the next three years, Donna. Okay? Uh, but for today, they get it right. They get it right. So far. They show up. They show up. In fact, they go further um, when, in verse 12. When they looked up from a distance and they didn't recognize him, they wept loudly. And then each one tore his garments and scattered dust, which are official grieving and mourning techniques in the Hebrew tradition. So the second thing they did is they wept. They mourned with their friend. So again, they get it right. They show up. They mourn. Then they do something that is even that is as they do something really important to close out this passage, and something that I need to learn to do a little better. They sat with Job on the ground seven days and seven nights. Not speaking a word. Not speaking a word. They kept their mouths shut. How many of us have been with our friends or family that are grieving and we're so desperate. Yeah, I'm the first one. So desperate to offer some sort of wisdom or at least comfort. We've got to say something to our grieving friends and family. But that's not always, and rarely is, the answer to someone's grief. His friends get it right. They shut up. One of my friends from way back, and he was older. Um, he was even older than Bob. Um, so, like, I, we, he was, he, we, we all coached basketball and and well, it was at the high school, so we had football coaches, basketball, baseball. We shared an office, and but we had this old guy, and uh, his name was Bob too, just by coincidence. And uh, but he taught us all as young folks. He was like, never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> And I have remembered that. I don't use that, but I've remembered that. <laughs> you know, 20, 15, 20 years later, I can still remember. Never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. And so Job friends get that right. They get it right. And so it's a very, very important part of this process. But the number one thing for today, the takeaway that we're going to remember, is that the first thing about being a quality friend it's the single most important thing for us to remember. It's the single most important part of being a quality friend. And that is showing up. Show up for your friends. Show up when they invite you to come to your daughter's first birthday party. 
show up when they invite you to the baby shower that's men included, Matt. And that's the last thing that you want to do. Show up when they invite you to come over because uncle so-and-so is coming by to visit. Show up for all those celebrations that your quality friend is inviting you to come to. Show up when they're getting an award at a banquet at night. Show up for all those great things. And show up when they need something from you. When they need you to come and just sit with them because they're having a bad day. Show up when they're grieving the loss of a loved one and just sit with them as they don't know what else to do. Show up is the single most important thing that we can do for our friends. And Job's friends get this right. So through this passage, they are quality friends. They show up, they mourn, they don't say anything. And that is a critical part of being a good friend. And any of you, and most of you, in the last few years have had an opportunity, that's a terrible word, have had the unfortunate time to grieve. And we have all grieved for one person or another. And we, so we know, all of us know, the value of when someone shows up. And um, I had gone through a period of time with family that, you know, we had lost very few people. And so I was out of practice, thankfully, thank God, until my dad passed away. And I just remember people showing up and how awesome that made me feel. And it wasn't about me, but it made me feel just really like, I, man, I do have some quality friends. How awesome it was to go to the mailbox and get a card from somebody that couldn't show up in person because it was so far away, uh, but that showed up in one way or another. And as you're thinking about this and you're thinking about your friends, um, I got a couple little uh, tidbits for you from Dear Wendy. Has anybody ever read Dear Wendy? I don't even know if Wendy's a real person because I got this off the internet. And so... You know, it must be real. That's right, I wasn't going to say it. Actually, it was from a real article, though. Uh, the Huffington Post had an article, but they were quoting Dear Wendy. And so hopefully Dear Wendy is a, a good soul. But she has a couple good things for us to think about that I wrote down here for us. Sometimes the people you show up and show up and show up for... Let me re rephrase that because I paused because I was confused. I don't do good reading things. I'm not a good reader. <laughs> Sometimes, that's why we don't, I don't write out my sermons because that would be just really terrible reading. So now you just get terrible all around the world. You really just need Pastor Melissa every Sunday. And I just need to stand up and look pretty. All right, let's get back to it. Dear Wendy, sometimes the people you show up and show up and show up for let you down. Amen? We can all, we all can probably have a list of people. That we could throw under the bus. But listen to this one. And sometimes they show up and show up and show up for you and you let them down. We just scooted a little bit down in our pews, right? And sometimes the people you've blown off or that you would blow off if given the opportunity are the first to show up for you. That's a powerful statement. That's an ouch. Sometimes the people you've blown off or that you would blow off if given the opportunity are the first to show up for you. Some powerful words to chew on. Job's friends probably had many opportunities to blow him off. And they probably had their own families. They had their own farms. They had their own responsibilities. 
They're coming from other places. They're not in the same community. Um, but they show up. Especially nowadays, as all of us know here, you and I together, we are overbooked. And we have so much to do. And a lot of it is legitimate and we can't get rid of it. Some of it, we could reevaluate our priorities and change our behaviors. But a lot of it is we're legitimately busy because we're taking care of people or we're working because we have to work and those sorts of things. But whatever the case is, that's not what this sermon's about today. The point is we are, we are busy. And some kind, sometimes we're overwhelmed by our schedules. But we have to be very careful for the people that we call friends and that count on us as friends, more importantly, that we, in certain circumstances, are willing to drop everything and show up. Are willing to drop everything and show up. Now that's not going to be for everybody on your Facebook of friends. It's not going to be for everybody even, frankly, in your whatever, close circle of work pals. But you've got a list of quality friends that you're maintaining in family that you've got to be and I've got to be willing to drop everything. Everything. And just show up because that's the number one thing in terms of having quality friendships. We don't want to be the one that lets them down. And I know I don't want to be the one that lets them down. You don't want to be the one that lets them down. And it's so important to show up. Job's friends showed up. Job's friends were able to um, I'm missing the word but they were able to empathize. They grieved with them. And Job's friends knew enough about the situation originally to keep their mouth shut. And so it's a great lesson for us to take. We don't need to say much more about that. But as we go on our way today and we think about, you know, being a better friend to somebody, maybe shortening our list of who we consider friends. I mean, it's a dangerous thing to do. I don't want you to, the res proper response is not to go out here and cut friends. <laughs> so I shouldn't have said that. Um, but in reality, we can only manage so many human relationships. That's the truth. If you're talking about sales, even, you know, whatever, you can have 12 meaningful relationships, but I'm getting sidetracked. Just think about these quality relationships. And if you want to maintain that person as a quality friend, you better show up. You better show up. The great thing, and we'll close with this, the great thing about <clears throat> being in a faith community is that we have an opportunity here. And St. John's is a great place for that. To nurture those kinds of quality relationships. And so maybe your family's not large enough to have a good pool of quality friends. Maybe you live in an isolated neighborhood. Maybe you're, you are retired, so you don't have a lot of work friends. Um, but our faith community is a built-in place where you should have access to some quality friendships. And we do here at St. John's. And we have to continue to nurture that and work on that. Um, but it is a built-in place where you'll have people that are going to come beside you and celebrate the good times. And also be there when you're grieving. And so that's one of the main reasons to be a Christian. And that's why being a Christian doesn't work to find God in the boat fishing in the lake. Because when you need a quality friend, the fish aren't going to be there for you. You need to be in a faith community, and you are, which is a great thing. The Bible never promises us that being a Christian is going to protect you from grieving moments. What the Bible does promise is that you're never going to go it alone. And that's why. And that's why it's important to be following God through Jesus Christ.
the Christ. Showing up is the most important thing we can do, and Job's friends did. What we're going to discover next week, as we gather together, is that as time goes on, Job's friends are going to wear down. And so we're going to be very tempted to get very angry with them. But then we're going to re remember what happens to me when I get tired and hungry and frustrated that my friend won't snap out of it. Right? So it's a very important message next week as we continue this series on friendships. Amen.